Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. For a new week, uh, we're going to be continuing to study um, Daniel chapter 11, but to do so, we're going to go back and look at uh, the civil wars. So we started to recognize that there's a connection between the civil wars, uh, the divisions of the Greek Empire, the North and the South, and that the North and the South also figure as civil wars within uh, God's people, uh, beginning in 977 BC. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that we have to study this morning, and we invite your Spirit's presence into our study. And we pray that your Holy Spirit can teach us and guide us and lead us. Um, be with us, um, be with those who are studying these things and those that uh, have participated and continue to participate. We ask that your angels can watch over them and that uh, you can continue to work in our lives. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, good morning again. Now, uh, on Thursday, we were looking at the Civil War and um, trying to understand the relationship between, because uh, we talked about Ellen White's Civil War visions. And here you see this chart, which um, was amended. That is, uh, Dwight has suggested that the dates given on uh, in Wikipedia and other places, a lot of people believe that the end of the Civil War in the United States was April 9th, 1865. But you can find sources that give it as May 9th, 1865. So uh, the one source that gives it uh, as, or the sources that give it as um, uh, the end of the war being April 9th has to do with the surrender of the Union General Ulysses. No. Or, pardon me, I'm getting it backwards. Of General Robert E. Lee, surrender to... So he's the Confederate general. Correct. Surrendering to the Union General Ulysses S. Grant. Correct. And you're, uh, you're, it's at Appomattox. It's so Appom Appomattox. Appomattox on April 9th, 1865. And then um, we have uh, May 9th, 1865. Uh, was when President Andrew Johnson issued a proclamation declaring the end of armed resistance in the South. This effectively signaled the termination of the American Civil War, an event that had uh, riven the nation in two, North and South, for four grueling years. That's what they say here on this uh, post. So, so there's two different dates that are given. We could look at it as April 9th, or we could look at it as May 9th. Now, if it's April 9th, it's going to be the 12th day of the first month. Now, the 12th day of the first month is a symbol uh, that I think is important. One is it relates to uh, when Ezra leaves the river Ahava. It's on the 12th day of the first month in 457 B.C. And one of the things about this line is it represents uh, symbols that occur on those lines. We see the war starting on April 12th, 1861, which is the first day of the first month. Uh, we have the, the July 21st Battle of Manassas in 1861, and th that July 21st being a symbol of midnight. Uh, we have um, Ellen White's second uh, Civil War vision, and that's going to be on 13 days after the Battle of Manassas, and it's going to be about the Battle of Manassas. So that's going to be on August 3rd, 1861, the 13 days representing uh, 18,720 minutes is a symbol of July 18, 2020. And um, it's also going to be, if you look at her first Civil War vision on January 12th, 1861, you can see the, the number of days to the start of the war is 90. And then to the Battle of Manassas is another 100 days. So it's 190. And then you have the 13 days. So I didn't put it in there, but it'd be 103 days or 203 days, pardon me. Um, you have 51 weeks between her first 
uh, and last vision, and then 22 weeks from her second vision to um, her third vision. So we also see then is 203 uh, days, ends up being 29 weeks. So there's going to be 29 weeks plus 22 weeks, which adds up to be 51 weeks. And then the 22 weeks is 154 days. And we're going to see that in these Civil War visions, that these dates uh, relate as symbols. So, for instance, uh, you're going to see uh, the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. But that's going to be the 10th day of the 10th month. And uh, there was also uh, talk about um, uh, Ellen White had forbidden Adventists to participate, I think it was in a national fast for the war uh, on the behalf of the North. The North had declared this national fast. Abraham Lincoln had done this. And, and then she said that we are not to participate in that, that fast. But after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, that national fast that was appointed for April 30th, 1863, she encouraged Adventists to participate in that national fast. So there, there's a lot of history connected with this Civil War and Ellen White and Adventism. Obviously, we know in 1863, that's when the Adventist Church is going to um, become incorporated. right? So it becomes officially a church. Um, so that's a big part of Adventist history, that the origins of this church as an institution is connected to uh, the Civil War. And one of the reasons that they... Uh, organized was uh, to allow uh, uh, religious reasons to not participate in in the war, in the draft, right? So I don't know exactly where we should start. I mean, I was thinking that we should probably start uh, with the, uh, the Civil War um, in Israel, and then we'll come back to some of these things again, right? So so let's go to, um, I guess probably, because there's lots that we need to, uh, to look at. So, so we're just going to start slowly and just work our way meticulously, uh, picking through every bit of information. <clears throat> so we're going to go to, uh, first Kings 11, one. Now, you know, starting here with this, uh, what would be the significance of this as a symbol? Besides is there, the one one one. No. What what is the one 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 representing? Well, the Solomon is entering into leagues that he shouldn't enter into, for one. Okay. Yeah. So we can connect it to January eleventh, right? Right. So we, January eleventh, uh, as part of the Levitical chiasm, right? So that's going to be 63 days after November 9th, 2019. You have January 11th, 2020, and, and Jeff has marked that. We also have it January 11th, 2023, connected to Collins' uh, prediction to the structure that he had of the prophetic mirror. And so, so we've seen this before. Now, this, of course, is not the Civil War uh, yet, but this is just preceding what's going to happen. So this is about Solomon. So he, he turns from the Lord. He has all of these leagues. So I think it, it, it's probably important to start here uh, with these leagues. So Solomon loved many strange women, so foreign women, right? Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Now, <coughs> excuse me. So Solomon obviously is the king, right? And we know that the kingdom is going to fall apart at the end of Solomon's reign. But he does, he's the one who builds the temple. Uh, David didn't build the ten temple because he was a man of war. God wanted his son to do that. So Solomon's going to be the one that does that. 
And um, so he has all of these foreign wives. He had 700 wives, princes, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then Solomon then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, Chemosh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he all he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Now, of course, this is an important part of understanding what's going to happen when Solomon dies. So um, they they still have this. Obviously, he built the sanctuary. They still have the worship in God's temple in Jerusalem. But the king has departed from that and built all of these other um, temples to these false gods. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore, the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David, my thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Albeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake. And for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the seed of Eden. So what's the significance here of Hadad? There, there's actually a lot here that we, we're going to have to delve into. But uh, what's the basic idea about Hadad, this Edomite? So what is he doing? He's he's an adversary unto Solomon. Anybody know? We're, we're going to read on a bit, but there's uh, if we read about him. So I'm just going to do it this way. So you're going to first see him mentioned here in 1114. Uh, he's going to be mentioned other places. Um, let me see if I can. Here, I'll do it this way. So Hadad is, um, he's the king of Edom, right? So he's, he's not, he's not the king, but he's of the king's seed, right? So it says, for it came to pass when David was in Edom and Joab, the captain of the host was gone up to bury the slain after he had spent every male in Edom. For six months, the Joab remained there with all of Israel until he had cut off every male in Edom that Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. Now, um, so when we look at the Hebrew number for Hadad, we get this number, 1908. Okay. It means mighty. Um so this is the fourth definition, a member of the royal house of Edom who escaped the massacre under Joab and fled with a band of followers into Egypt. After David's death, he returned to his own country. Now, we have two different uh, Hebrew numbers. So we'll look in 1 Kings eleven seventeen, And we see Hadad um, with the number H111. Okay. Now, what are the symbols that we see here? Well, as we just addressed, I mean, one, one, one. Okay. 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 So you have that symbol of January 11th. Right. And then Iran has put the answer to the other one. Okay. 
so the so this is the hundred and eighty seventh prime is what he meant, not right. So so the number one 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 seven is the hundred and eighty seventh prime number, and eleven times seventeen is also one eighty seven. And we first see the eleven and seventeen in the story of Joseph. So when he's seventeen, he sold to the Ishmaelite traders and then uh, is a servant and then a prisoner for eleven years until uh, he has he interprets the two dreams of the butler and baker, and then eleven years later, his dream that he had when he was seventeen is fulfilled, and then he spends uh, seventeen years with his father Jacob before he dies. So you have seventeen, eleven, eleven, seventeen years in that story. And 11 times 17 is 187. And also the two 11s giving you the two the 22 years from when he has his dream to when it's fulfilled. So the symbol of restoration. But we also have here that Hadad has two different uh, definitions that are given. 111, Adad. Um, so if we look at that, it says Adad, I shall move softly, I shall love, is the definition of it. Um and you know, yeah, okay, Dwight. No, something buzzed on my phone, so okay. And then we have the other definition, uh, 1908, right? So in 1114, it's going to introduce that one. Um, so we've had this before where there's two a word that has two different strong numbers, and if you look at it, it it, it's got a different definition in this case. And this one's hadad, so it has the he at the beginning, so it's he dalit dalit. Um, and then the other one is an aleph at the beginning, aleph dalit dalit. So it's a d d, right? Has a different meaning. So the question is, why does he have these two different? Uh, ways of spelling his name that have two different definitions um, and and why this symbol then of 111. So it's kind of interesting. So so one thing is it would tie us to, and, and the 111 is going to show up in 11 verse 17. So that's going to be the first time that definition shows up uh, in, in connection with this person. Now, um, it says the total King James Version occurrences of this definition. It says none in uh, the, uh, the King James Concordance, and I'm not sure how it can be none since it's here. So I'm not sure why that is. Um, and if we look at this in Hebrew, I'm just going to take a peek in Hebrew here. So here you're going to see uh, this. They put 1908 here, right? I don't know if you can see that. This is where my mouse is. And but notice it's Aleph Dalit Dalit. So so it should be one 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 here. It shouldn't be 1908 because you can see here it's uh, they got a vav just just means and, and then it has a he Dalit Dalit. So for some reason, in the Hebrew Bible, in this location only, they use an Aleph at the beginning of the name Hadad to be Adad. Strange. But the fact that it occurs must mean something, right? right. It's draw, drawing our attention to, to this verse as a symbol. So, you know, when we started this study here today, you know, and, and I looked at, we started here in, I never knew where I was going to start. And we looked at uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1, and we noticed this symbol of 11, 11, 1, right? The 11th of January, that symbol that comes from our lines. And then we start talking about, Adad or Hadad, and we see him first in verse 14. He's this adversary of Solomon. And 
And then we see in this verse, 1117, that Hadad is this same symbol of 111, the only place in the Bible where Hadad is used, this, this spelling of his name is used. So it's telling us something, right? And, and it's speaking to us particularly because I don't know of anyone else who uses Strong's numbers um, other than this movement. I mean, there might be people who do. Um, actually, I can think of one guy who uses them sometimes, but not in the way that we do, right? To connect them to specific dates. So we have some things that we do with these symbols um, that are, are pretty much unique. And so only we would really notice this. And if I was reading my Hebrew Bible, uh, for some reason, they put the H111 here, but in the Hebrew, when we look at this same verse, they use the 1908 symbol. So even though it is Aleph, Dalet, Dalet, instead of He, Dalet, Dalet. Right? So, so I know, it's telling us something. What specifically, I don't know. Okay. Now, what we're studying, of course, is the civil war that's going to result. So uh, this becomes an important part of this story. Um, so it says that Hadad fled, he and his certain Edomites, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with him out of Paran, and they came to Egypt, unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which gave him a an house, and appointed him victuals and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave uh, him to wife, the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tapanes, the queen. And the sister of Tapanes bare him Gendubath, his son, whom Tapanes weaned in Pharaoh's house, and Gedubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers, and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said unto Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to mine own country. Then Pharaoh said unto him, But what hast thou lacked with me, that, behold, thou seekest to go to thine own country? And he answered, Nothing, albeit let me go in any wise. And God stirred him up, another adversary, Reason, the son of Elida, Eliada, which fled from his lord Hadadezer, king of Zobah. And he gathered men unto him and became captain over a band when David slew them of Zobah. And they went to Damascus and dwelt there, therein, and reigned in Damascus. So that's in, of course, Syria. And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, beside the mischief that Hadad did. And he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zerida, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at that time, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him in the way, and he had clad himself with the new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give thee ten tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the god of the Zidonians, and Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, or Malcolm, the god of the children of Ammon. And have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father. Howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, 
that will make him prince all the days of his of his life for David, my servant's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give one tribe, that David, my servant, may have a light all way before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shalt be king over Israel. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as David, my servant did, that I will be with thee and build thee a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel unto thee. And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. And the rest of the Acts of Solomon, all that he did in his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned over in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. <clears throat> okay, so that's the story of Solomon and his adversaries. So he has three adversaries. Hey, Dad. Um, uh, this other guy, what's his name? Um, um, re- reason, resin. So, um, so not. So he's going to dwell in D- Damascus. You can see a similarity to to the, the king later on in seven forty two. Uh, with that civil war, um, let me see. Yeah. So, and then, um, and then Hadad, and and then of course Jeroboam. Now Jeroboam is going to be placed over uh, Joseph. So when we talk about Joseph, he had charge over the house of Joseph. Uh, that would be Ephraim, right? Right. Okay. So Joseph and Ephraim are often equated with each other. So, yeah, we know Joseph had the two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But usually when you refer to Joseph, you're just referring to the tribe of Ephraim. You're not usually including Manasseh. Right. So, so this is, of course, going to be one of the reasons why Jeroboam can take over the northern kingdom, because he already has authority there. Um, so we, we've noticed a few symbols and I'm not sure how much we should go through these. I mean, we have the three adversaries. So these are adversaries while Solomon is king, right? Uh, not right from the beginning, but some of them near the beginning, some of them later on, Jeroboam, obviously later. Uh, hey, dad's going to be the first one mentioned and then Rezin, the second one mentioned in the third Jeroboam. Okay, so what is the significance of these three enemies? Aren't they all representing factions that are opposing Solomon? Okay, yeah. But wouldn't they be the three angels' messages? That's an interesting way of looking at it. Okay. I mean, so we could probably create a line, you know, with this, with these, the symbols that are given to us. We haven't looked at all of them yet. Um, but, but we have these symbols here. And so there must be some way in which we can look at Solomon's reign um, as a line, you know, with these, these adversaries. Now, these adversaries here. Uh, how would the adversaries represent the three angels' messages? I mean, the three angels' messages is the everlasting gospel. Why would I say, well, these adversaries represent the everlasting gospel? Why are the adversaries brought in? To show Solomon the, the, the path that he was taking was wrong. 
Right. So they're, they're corrective. Correct. Corrective decisions to show him that, that, that the course that he's taking is wrong. And, and we can see that with the everlasting gospel. These are corrective messages, right? Yes. They address the sin problem. And here, you know, God is using these to symbolize this. Now, I don't know if I want to go into to too much detail on this, but I mean, maybe, maybe we should. I don't know. Um, because I really wanted to look at the Civil War, but we can see this is all a precursor to the Civil War that's going to happen. We definitely need to know about uh, what is happening to Solomon's kingdom, how it has gone into this idolatry, and and that helps us understand what's going to happen in the next chapter. So, so we have this, uh, the precursor to the Civil War, so to speak. Now, Jeroboam, of course, becomes... Uh, the most important one here, and and that's because he's going to become the king of of the northern tribes. Now it's interesting too here. Um, it always says that that uh, Solomon's sons gets one tribe, and that Jeroboam gets ten. Now that's kind of odd because how many pieces does he tear? Uh, this um, garment into twelve pieces. Okay, so it does it with twelve, right? And I'll take the kingdom out of the sons. I'll, I'll give unto thee ten pieces, but I will give uh, uh, one tribe. That, uh, but I'll give his son, that is Rehoboam, one tribe. Well, why, why does it say one tribe? Why is there twelve pieces? Ten are given to Jeroboam, but Rehoboam is going to get one. But it doesn't really add up. Well, in the technicality, you have the Levites, which is God's piece. So they're not being included. But isn't Judah and Benjamin being assumed as one tribe rather than two? Okay. So, so first, we know that Levites are not reckoned among the tribes, right? So, I don't think we can just say that the Levites, because they're not there. All of the tribes have Levites. There's Levites everywhere, right? right. Correct. So, there's cities of the Levites throughout the kingdom. Um, so, so they're not really counted. But yeah, Benjamin is going to be attached to. To Judah. Okay. Um, but it's just weird that it, it doesn't say two tribes. It's just going to give you one. Right? So you, you think about it, you know, somebody doing this, um, you know, we're, he's, it's basically a, a, a parable that's acted out. So he's going to take this, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, where does it say that uh, what what is where, where is it? okay the garment so he caught the new garment that was on him right so it's called the new garment um and he's going to tear it into twelve pieces now there's there's a number of symbols here so let's let's take a look at this okay so we have Ahijah now so this is uh, a prophet of the Lord right. So this is he's a prophet and that's going to find Jeroboam. Um, uh, yeah, so he's the third de definition of prophet who predicted the revolt of the northern tribes. So there's lots of different Ahijahs. Um, and it means brother of Jehovah, Yahoo. Okay, so... <clears throat> so we have this Ahijah. Now he's going to take this new garment. Um, now why is it important that it's a new garment that's on Jeroboam? Is there any significance there? Well, if it's a new garment and it's never been worn before, then isn't that 
indicative of something special. Okay. I wasn't really thinking about that so much. Now, this word, nukhadash, chadash. Now, it's similar to kodash, but that's a different, like, at least in sound, but kodash starts with a kov. It means fresh or new. It comes from this other word. And, oops, get that wrong. 2318, so it comes from this one. Chadash, to be new, renew, repair. Now, I'm just trying to see the, because if I looked at that word, I would see this word. So one of the things is you'll see that it's also related to the new moon. Okay, so so if I looked at that word Kadash and I didn't have the vowel pointings, I would just see this word Kodash. And that's the new moon. So, again, that comes from the word 2318 to be new. Okay, so is there significance that we can attach this word to the word the new moon. So it's just one Hebrew number different, just a different vowel pointing. Okay. You're saying that this is Hebrew 2318. Yeah, it's 2319 is the word there that's translated as new. It's related to the word. It comes from the word 2318, which means to be new or renew or repair. And it's also the word when you talk about the new moon, the Kodesh. The Kodesh is the new moon, the month. It's called a month. So if you look up the word month, it'll be Kodesh. It means the new. Right. So so I see that right away because I'm familiar with the Hebrew word for moon or month. And so I see, okay, this word looks similar, and it is the same consonant, just has a different vowel, right? So, so we have this new garment. So this is symbolizing something to do with chronology, right? Can we say that? Okay. Now we have this garment. This is the number. 8,008 is the Hebrew number, Salma, right? Uh, a related word, it's just a, a, what they call a transposition, sil, Simla, they just reverse later, letters. Um, so it's an outer garment, a mantle, a wrapper, okay? And and if you invert those two letters, so if you do simla instead of salma, it means um, the idea of a cover, assuming the shape of an object beneath, a dress, especially a mantle. So you can see that these two different definitions. So again, we have a, a word that, that can have two different def, two different Hebrew numbers, but it's inverted, right? Just inverting those two center letters which is very odd, okay? Um, so we have this new garment. Now, what is a garment representing? It could represent Kosh Rajasimus. Well, it can represent character, okay? So it could represent character. I mean, obviously, if it's a righteous garment, so to speak, it's a righteous character. Okay, anything else? You know, there's a lot of symbols here. I still look at a garment being more something in line with character. So, as, as as what? As character. Yeah. So I would say it has to do with character. Now, um, but the fact that we have this word new. Now we have to remember about the Hebrew vowel pointings. 
Like originally Hebrew did not have any vowels attached to the consonants. Like, you know, modern Hebrew, if you bought, you know, uh, a Hebrew newspaper or book or anything like that, um, they're not going to have vowel pointings. They're just going to have the consonants. The vowels are, are something that are just assumed. Now later the Masoretes added the vowel pointings, um, you know, as the Hebrew language began to be lost, they wanted to preserve the pronunciation that they had for these words. We don't know if how those words were originally pronounced. That is, it's very likely that, you know, that the word Kodesh was just Kodesh, no matter how you used it. Um, uh, but here, if we're going to use this as a month, right? As, as a symbol of a month and we attach it to a garment, uh, what is that representing? A month to a garment? Yeah, because it says month. The word new, and we could just, we could just say the month garment. You know, if we wanted to, to just ignore the fact that there's a different vowel pointing. If I was just going to look, look at the word and I saw the word Kodesh and I would say a month garment, um, what is a month garment? What is a gar what can a garment represent symbolically? Well, the way you're approaching this would almost like would also almost say new beginning, but I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to puzzle this one through. Okay. So think about um uh Psalm 104 verse 2, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain or Isaiah 51 16 lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner right but my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished so if we think about a garment as a symbol of connected to this idea of new in, in the context of chronology, that this is a new beginning, right? This is beginning a line, right? Can we see? The time of the end, the time of the beginning. Does it make sense to people what I'm trying to say here? But this is something that helps mark uh, this kingdom being divided. Is divided from a new garment. It's uh, maybe I'm stretching things. Maybe I'm looking too abstractly. And and we have this 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 uh, symbol for month. And we're going to see why that's important as we look at this line. OK. Um, but I'm just saying that that he caught this new garment, which is literally true. But in Hebrew, they understand uh, that puns. Plays on words, words that sound the same, uh, can give significance to a text. So the fact that this is a new garment that was on him, now they're going to piece it into 12 pieces, right? So it says rent and rent it, but that word rent, kara, 7167, is related to the word kara, which means peace, right? So you have uh, uh, one that is a noun and one that is a verb, right? So this word kara means to tear in pieces, and the piece, the, the pieces, the 12 pieces, just the result of something that's been rent. Those are the pieces, right? So we don't see that in English, but if we could, we're going to put it, um, you know, you could say it was rendered into 12 renderings or, or pieced into 12 pieces, right? And then we have, of course, the number 12, Shenanayim, uh, and, and it could be because we have like two different uh, forms of dual, or dual and um, so twofold it could mean, but also the twelfth. And then uh, 
with the 10. So you could put it here, it's, it's 2 and 10. So that's 12. That's why they have the two different numbers. Okay? So that's the teeth. So make sense? 2 and 10. And then we have this word pieces. Now, what is there about the Hebrew number there? 7168. So we have the number 7 and the 168. Maybe I'm putting too much emphasis upon these Hebrew numbers, but 168 is the number of hours in a week. And so we have 7, which represents a week, and 168, which represents a week. So we have these two symbols for a week in that word pieces. Okay, anything else? So we haven't really, you know, created a line here yet. So how could we place this this event, this rending of a garment into 12 pieces? Are we going to line that up with the secession of states in the Civil War, in the American Civil War? Okay. So that's interesting. So I don't know lots about the American Civil War. So we're going to have uh, how many states succeed? The technicality is 11 seceded, 13 attempted to secede, but two of those wound up with just shadow governments. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, I remember I had a map showing the order of succession. It would just, you know, show how the state succeeded um, in, in the order that they did. So you end up with a 13, but it's it's 11. Correct. And 2. Okay. Which is interesting. Now, originally there was, was there originally 13 states when... Uh, the United States became the United States? 1776, there were 13 colonies that became the original 13 states. Yeah. Okay. Now, by the time, I, I'd have to look at my history, but I think there was something like 30 states by the time of the Civil War. Yeah. Um, Theodore, did you want um, to know what, 168 times 7 was. Well, no, I know it's 1176. I wasn't really asking that question. Oh, okay. Just right. asking for the symbols themselves. Right? Okay. Yeah, but thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, so... Let me see. Okay. Um, I used to have this nice map. I don't know where. Probably got it from Wikipedia. I got this map here. It's not as nice as the one that I saw before. Okay. So status of the states in 1861. So you got slave states. Slave states that succeeded before April 15th, 1861. Slave states that succeeded after April 15th, 1861. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell. Border, border southern states that permitted slavery but did not succeed. You got that Lincoln was elected November 6th, 1860. You have, yeah. okay, in 1860, only one state seceded from the Union. And that's the dark red that you have just under your pointer, which was South Carolina. Right here. Correct. Beginning in 1861, the second state that seceded was Mississippi. The third was Florida. 
The, okay. The fourth was Alabama. The fifth was Georgia. The sixth was Louisiana. So the states from where your pointer had been yeah. all the way through the deep south were the first six to have seceded. The seventh seceded on February 1st, and that That's was Texas. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a list of this here. I can just show you this. This is from my paper on the American Civil War. Um, so it's got South Carolina, and I have the biblical dates there uh, that they seceded. Uh, but yeah, you can see then February 1st, Texas. And then February 4th, 1861, the Constitution of Confederate States of America is drafted. Okay, now is you're showing South Carolina on December 20th of 1860 as the sixth day of the 10th month. And for some reason, when I'm looking at this, I'm showing South Carolina seceding on the seventh day of the 10th month, biblically. Okay, so you're looking at the calendar converter? Yeah. So when I did this, um, so first off, um, the, the calendar converter, when it deals with the, uh, the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th month, it's, it's not correct. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. That is, the biblical calendar, the, the first six months, the dates, uh, the days are 3029, 3029, 3029, invariably, right, on the biblical calendar. But the the seventh month isn't always 30 days long. It could be 29. Right. Same with the eighth month and the ninth month and the tenth month. Those are going to be based on observation of the new moon. So I would have figured this out using the Torah calendar um, website. So I would have I would have used that to figure out which was the first day of the 10th month. So that would be based on observation. The calendar converter doesn't do that. It just uses 3029, 3029 all the way through, except in certain places where we corrected it because it was uh, important dates. So so this is probably correct that it's the sixth day of the 10th month. But I'm just going to double check here. So in 1860. And we have what date? Um, 20th of December of 1860. Yeah. So the the first day is going to be uh, December 14th. So 14, 15, 16, 17. And it's going to be the 20th yes. date. So, yeah, it would actually be the seventh day of the 10th month. So so the, the reason that stuck in my head okay. is that if that's the seventh right. day of the 10th month, yeah. Chiastically, mm -hmm. isn't that a representation of the Day of Atonement? Yeah. Yeah, it is. So so I corrected that one. So I'm not sure how I came up with these dates back in 2018. I didn't have the calendar converter yet. Um, I might have, instead of using, it's hard to say, I, I might have actually counted it uh, some other way. I don't know. But anyway. Uh, so that would change all of these then to uh, the 27th day of the 10th month. No, no, you, you actually, no, oh, excuse me. Yes, you're right. That would be the 27th day for Mississippi. You're right. This would be the, because it's the same month. <clears throat> so, and then this would be the 30th day of the 10th month. Possibly depends on how many days that month has. So Ellen White's vision. So I'm just going to check what uh, what we have here. So yeah, so that's going to be the 30th day of the 10th month. So when you were when we were addressing this on Thursday, yeah, I was taking a look at several points with what we're looking at right now because I didn't, I didn't have your paper. So I did it. I did it differently looking at the date 
when Lincoln was elected, then going through this on the when the states seceded, when the Union forces controlled Fort Sumter, when Lincoln was inaugurated, and then Fort Sumter's fall. Now, when April 12th rolled around, as you're showing here, yeah. that was the first day of the first month of the biblical year 5906. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, throughout the balance of that year, up until the final state seeking to secede, and that final state was Kentucky. Kentucky and Missouri are the only two that attempted to secede and wound up with shadow governments. In other words, they were not in full control of their states. So you, you have 11 states that seceded and do those 11 states that seceded represent 11 portions from what we were talking about of this garment? Yeah, well, the thing is you have 10 and, and one. 1, which is weird, right? I mean, it's just like, I don't, so I don't know. Um, 10 and 1 gives us 11 even though technically there's 12. So I I just think it's kind of odd how the story there in the Bible goes, right? It's well, the, the so so you're saying that we can somehow equate this, which I think makes sense that these tribes representing these States. Now, of course you have the union, the union is one, right? Correct. Okay. So if, if we also consider this, mm-hmm. the eighth state to secede, which you, do, you, you don't have on your list, was the state of Virginia. Okay, so, so Virginia seceded when? Virginia seceded 17th of April of 1861 the sixth day of the first month of biblical year 5906. Okay, yeah, so that's going to be after the war begins. I have them here, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, Tennessee, subsequently joined the Confederates. So we have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up to Texas. Right. right? Eight, nine, ten, eleven, Correct. And then what you what you're not having on there, of course, are the the shadow governments for Missouri and Kentucky. Yeah. Now here's what is a shadow government. I'm not quite sure I understand that. Okay. Why are they not seceding? Because they're part they're gonna be part of the Confederacy. Okay. When if we if we step back a little bit in Amer- in American history Mm -hmm. There was a point prior to the war where you had what was called the Missouri Compromise. And you were not to have slaves above the latitude where Missouri was. Okay. Missouri was supposed to be a free state. Yet, there were many in Missouri that wanted to own slaves. Now, the same thing was occurring within Kentucky. And we have to keep in mind that Kentucky was the home state or the the birth state of Lincoln. Neither Mm -hmm. of these states had a majority that were in control of of that state. So neither of these two states were able to fully join the Confederacy. There were just portions of their population that sided 
with the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a bit of the governments in those states that the Union continued to control. Okay. I'll get you some further information on that. But okay. my point in returning to this on Virginia, during the Civil War, Virginia split into two states. North and South. No. Nope. East and West Virginia. Virginia. Virginia and West Virginia. Yeah, right. That makes more sense. East Virginia. Virginia and West Virginia. Correct. So they don't call it East Virginia, just Virginia and West Virginia. Correct. Okay. West Virginia split away because their sympathy was more with the North, while Virginia went solidly with the South. Okay. So of these 11 states that comprised the Confederacy, that 11 gave rise to a 12th, which may be another example of the 12 portions of the garment. Okay. Okay. So it's another way of trying to look at it, that there's, okay. Uh, I mean, it's complicated. I mean, and there's different ways that we could, uh, you know, adjust it. I mean, the main thing that we see here is that there is, there are the divisions that, um, now in this case, one of the things we have to look at when we deal with the North, the North is united, right? Correct. And it, it's really the one piece. And the South is the one that's uh, all of these divisions, right? All of these succeeded states. But we know when it comes to uh, Israel, the Northern Kingdom is going to be the 10 tribes and, and the Southern Kingdom, the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Right? Correct. It's reversed in that sense. And so, you know, the question is how much can we how, how can we deal with this north and south as symbols? We see the same thing in 742, of course, right? Because the southern kingdom is, you know, it's in a sense reversed from how we would look at it. Uh, I mean, the south would represent the north, the north would represent the south. If we you reverse them. Right. So, so, you know, how we address that. I mean, we know it's a battle between the north and the south. Uh, so we have that symbol, but how we're going to address what the South represents and what the North represents, um, I think, you know, becomes part of this, uh, this struggle, the North and the South in the story of Jet Daniel, how we looked at them, the South representing, you know, atheism, and communism, and the North representing apostate Protestantism, Republicanism, the United States, right? So, so that, you know, those are things that we have to consider. How do we, how do we deal with these symbols? But the main thing that we're looking at here, just to kind of uh, address what we saw in that story, is that we had symbols that related to time, right? Symbols that relate to our history. And we see this here in the American Civil War as well. And, and the primary one here, of course, is, well, there's two. We have Ellen White's vision, the Civil War vision. So in this vision, she's going to, this is Joseph Bates records this vision. And he took a particular interest in the prediction that she made. Because she says that, you know, there's this war that's going to happen, the Civil War. Now, at that point, only South Carolina had seceded to her knowledge when she has this vision. Right. So this is January 12th, and she had not yet heard about Mississippi, Florida, and Alabama seceding. Right. She's in Michigan. So the news has not re reached her at this point. Uh, so she talks about that there is going to be these other states seceding from the Union. 
in that vision and that many people, many families are going to lose men in this war. Now, the war is going to start 90 days later on April 12th, right? So she foresees this civil war three months in advance. Um, and, and to, and, and at that time, nobody's really thinking that this is going to turn into a civil war, right? It, it's not a, a given, right? The idea, especially in the North is, well, there's no way that there's, this is going to be a civil war. And if we do have any kind of conflict, it's going to be over quickly, which is why uh, the Battle of Manassas becomes uh, a real shock to the North. Uh, what happens there. And also Ellen White's then her second vision that's going to address the Battle of Manassas you know, 13 days after it occurs and, and God's intervention. So so there's a lot of significance here uh, prophetically in uh, as symbols, the war beginning on the first day of the first month, um, which we have in our lives. So, um, you know, it's to go back there so we can see and I'm going to go to this one just because it has more detail so this is going to show you know Ellen White's first vision January 12th right again you know the first day of the first month when the war begins Battle of Manassas July 21st that symbol then the 13 days symbol to Ellen White's second vision August 3rd being in 1299, the date attached to uh, the Gregorian date to July 27th, 1299, the Julian date. And then the 154 days, the 22 weeks. So we're going to see that 154 years comes into play in our lines as well. Um, and then her third vision. Now, the third vision is pretty comprehensive. So she only has the three visions dealing with the Civil War. Um, uh, and then, of course, we have the dates there that are also marked dealing with main events. And um, the 13th Amendment, different things. So in this one, we have May 9th. I'm just going to move this stuff over. It should be over on this side for some reason. It's slid over here. I know why, but. So this one has May 9th, 1865 as the end of the war. Um, right. So we have different dates that we had for this one has April 9th, 1865 as the end of the war. So whichever date is the correct one, this one has May 9th. Well, the, the May 9th was Andrew Johnson declaring that the war for all intents and purposes was over. Right. Now the final surrender of the war occurred on November 6th, 1865, exactly five years to the day from when Lincoln was inaugurated. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, when it comes to deciding a date in which something ends, I mean, there are different things that can mark it. But here, if it's May 9th, it's the 12th day of the second month. If it's April 9th, it's the 12th day of the first month. But there are symbols attached to both dates. So, prophetically, they're both significant. May 9th, um, uh, you know, in, in our history, May 9th is also uh, April 26th, but it's not that way in 1865. It's going to be April 20, 27th, 25th, 12 days, uh, or so 27th. Anyway, um, now, one of the things, the chart that we're going to look at here is this chart. So when we start going through these uh, these dates, we're going to see that there's this civil war that happens um, in 977 B, 977 BC. Now, the date, November 22nd, 
is the 15th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar. That's going to be when uh, Jeroboam is offering on the altar in Bethel, right? And and so we're going to look at that. You know, we're going to look at there's 235 years to the next civil war. And the symbol of 235 is the number of months in a metonic cycle. And then you're going to see um, from 742 BC, uh, there's 235 months to 723 BC, 19 years, right? So, so you can see this 235 showing up. And then from 723 uh, to um, what, 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 what this is addressing is these thanksgivings. So we're going to have to look at that. Um, but you're going to have here uh, the first civil thanksgiving, August 9th, 1623. And um, so that's why I'm marking that date. That's going to be 2,345 years. And then 154 years between then and uh, George Washington having a, a, a Thanksgiving proclamation, October 3rd, 1789. Uh, and then it's going to be observed on November 26th, 1789. And we're going to see a very similar thing when Abraham Lincoln makes a proclamation on October 3rd, uh, 1863. And they have the first, the start of that Thanksgiving continuing from the time that Abraham Lincoln proclaims it on November 26th, 1863. So you got the same two dates, uh, which is really interesting. So there, there's a bunch of things that we're going to look at in understanding uh these feasts, these celebrations, because remember, what does Jeroboam do when he, why is he offering on the 15th day of the eighth month in the altar, altar in Bethel? What has he done to do that? He's trying to separate uh, the worship in Israel from that in Jerusalem. Okay, yeah, and so he's creating a new feast day. Right. Right, right. you know, or a fast day, whatever it is. I mean, and then, it, something similar to the Day of Atonement, but he's doing it for northern Israel. Take a look at Aran's comment in the chat. Yeah, yeah November 26th, uh, Ellen White's birthday. So, um, and... Now, which year is she born in? I mean, she wouldn't be born in 1789, but 1820, right, 1827. That has all the digits of 1872. Okay. Yep. Okay, so um, so anyway, we have that November 26th date, Ellen White's uh, birthday. When Jeff, when Jeff Bowen trying to, because he was afraid of Israel, go back to Jerusalem mm-hmm. to do um, worship instead of yeah yeah we're going to look at that the main thing I just wanted to point out here is that it's a counterfeit feast day right so in American history they have these fasts and feasts right so the American uh, government is instituting you could say counterfeit fasts and counterfeit feasts that aren't from God, right? Now, it's not not necessarily in and of itself bad. It's just showing that there is this um, parallel between what happens in 977 BC in connection with the civil war, a rebellion, in a government creating new dates for feasts and fasts. And it's kind of interesting, the idea of a national fast. I, I don't think that would go too well nowadays. Um, go over too well. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to begin looking at this. We're going to go back, of course, to the story of the Civil War, the first Civil War. We could call it the Revolutionary War that happened in 977 BC. And then uh, work our way through these, this history. Biblical history and then American history. We'll be going back and forth and then coming to our time as well.
But remember, this whole time, it's really about understanding Daniel chapter 11. Okay. So uh, any final comments before we close with prayer? Not right now. So let's pray. Now, dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time here this morning. We know, Lord, that we're just beginning to sort through uh, this history. And we just pray that you can guide and direct so that we can clearly understand um, the past and how it relates to the present. Uh, we pray for each person in their personal life that you can work upon their hearts and that you can bring us closer to you. Bring us together again to study your word. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.